Optophobia, the fear of opening one's eyes. This podcast is dedicated to encouraging you, our listeners, to move beyond that fear, to solve riddles they don't want us to unriddle, to investigate supposedly ironclad truths, to unearth evidence buried for so long they believed it would stay buried. Season four. It's likely you've never heard of the most important movie of 1989. That's because in the end, Relentless was just another forgotten 1980s slasher film. But director William Lustig's original plan could have changed cinematic history forever. Lustig flavored his movie with enough subliminal messaging to spark mass murder by hundreds of wannabe serial killers sitting in the nation's theaters that summer. Why didn't it work? And why is Lustig still taking lunch meetings in Hollywood rather than rotting in jail. This season on Optophobia, we'll track down the distortions, the assumptions, the omissions. Are you bored by the lies? Open your eyes. Hi, everybody. I am your host, Dale Gribble. Americans love success, especially material success. We revere figures from our history and in our culture who make something of themselves by making millions. And of course, we want financial success for ourselves too. We want to emulate those heroes of Wall Street or Hollywood or Silicon Valley. The American dream is to move on up to the east side to a deluxe apartment in the sky. It is a testament to William Lustig, director of Relentless, that his subliminal messaging in the film was so effective that it tempted some viewers inclined toward financial moguldom to a life of serial murder. We're going to talk to one of those relentless fans today, but before we do that, I want to welcome my co-host for this week, Lydia Coffey Mate. Hi, Lydia. Hi, how are you, Dale Gribble? So good to see you. I'm good. How's your week been? Oh, it's been really good. I got big news. Oh, huge news. So, you know, my life partner, Christian and I, yep. you know, we're pretty much staying at home and staying put and doing a lot of home cooking. Uh, and that's going very still very well. Uh, this week we made a Chex Mix party pack. Does that come as a party pack or you made it? No, you have to, you have to design it yourself. And so you take all your little empty, like half partially boxes of Chex cereals. Okay. And if you have some of those little rye, those little brown rye, you know, those pieces, the one that everybody covets. Uh huh. Yeah, so good. And so you put all of that in like a big mixing bowl, and then you add all the flavorings and seasonings that, like, to your so choosing. I chose a lot of turmeric and paprika and garlic. And what you do is you kind of like mix it up in the bowl, add a little smidge of olive oil. And then there you go. Chex Mix Party Pack. And you just put it in little Ziploc bags and give it out to your friends. Was the whole thing just the little ride? tubes i like a lot of the rye to be honest when i save some bags for myself i do it with the extra rye chips because they're my favorite part i pick them out anyway but other than that it has the other little pieces of just the regular crisscross check cereal the puffy pillows of oh my god that's such a beautiful sentiment that sounds like a good activity for the week but that's not even my big news dale (laughs) okay isn't that crazy so christian and i we are just stuck in the house we're so cooped up we've decided we feel like we needed some friends so we got three guinea pigs. As pets. We got guinea pigs as pets, yes. Why three? Why not three? A lot of people might get them in pairs. Yeah, I just feel like, you know that phrase, two's company and three's a crowd? Uh-huh. I don't like it. I think that phrase is derogatory. It could just could be different with guinea pigs, too. Yeah, and, and technically, they're pack creatures. So I felt like if it was just two of them, they might get sick of each other. Mm-hmm. And so with the third, they could like, you know, be in a pair, be three's, three's company. They have options. They have options. And yes. So their names are Delbert, Samson, and Rick. Delbert, Samson, and Rick. Yes. Is there any meaning behind those names or did, did you just pick them out of a 
just because you liked the, how they sounded. It was mostly how uh, how we like how they sounded. They rolled off the tongue nice. Uh, but all the names we picked, we put them all on little post-it notes and folded them and put them in a hat. And then those are the three that got chosen. What do they live in? Do they have a kind of a big container? My house is decently large. It's enough for, you know, two people to be comfortable. So they just run around the house. Yeah, so do Christian and I. Right, so they're roommates, really. Oh my God, I didn't even think of it that way. How's the whole thing going with five new residents in the house? Or three new residents, five total. Yeah, so all five of us have seemed to be getting along really well. They also enjoyed the Chex Mix party pack. Did not love the garlic. Uh, we had a little, Samson had a little bit of an indigestion issue with some of the garlic in the Chex Mix. And so I, I made him his own special batch that had no garlic. A uh, little accident. Yeah, to say the least. Well, let's move along so we can meet our, our guest for the week. Unfortunately, the guest that we had originally scheduled to talk to today, Calypso, North Carolina-based herring farmer Regina Jerp, uh, was unable to join us. You might remember that back in the 80s, Regina worked in craft services uh, on Hollywood sets and has written that on the set of Relentless, Lustig insisted that the entire crew have round-the-clock access to walrus blood. But a couple of days ago, Regina told our producers that a few volunteers for this week's big Calypso herring festival called in sick, and she was going to have to decorate the herring trucks herself this year. So she didn't have time to be on the show. But we will try to get her back at another date. The walrus blood stuff is true. I know. I've seen that story in a bunch of different places. Emilio Estevez has quite a few stories about that. Well, we'll definitely have to get her back on. So we got very lucky. Uh, at the very last minute, our producers were able to snag an interview with a great guest joining us from his home in Washington, D.C. Lance Bloomberg is with us. Welcome to Optophobia, Lance. Oh, thank you. Thank you for having me, Dale. And Lydia, thank you both for having me. Of course. It's an honor to have you. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do for a living in Washington? Oh, well, as you have stated, Dale, my name is, is Lance, and I am a resident of Washington, D.C. Though it is a transient area, I am born and raised in D.C., though many cannot tell by my accent. I do enjoy living in D.C. It is a hub of government, and it has a, a very specific culture. And if you are into finance as I am, it's a wonderful place to reside. Yeah. So I knew that you were a financial analyst. Did you grow up interested in money or organizing money or making money for yourself and other people? Well, I, I did not have an innate interest in finance when I was growing up, but my father was very strict and he he literally beat finance into me. He would drill me constantly on uh, math and accounting problems. And uh, if I got incorrect answers, he would make me do uh, wall sits for extended periods of time. So not only am I a financial analyst, but my quads and core are extremely strong. That's so funny you say that because when I was growing up, my, my daddy had one of those um, finance books for dummies. You know that whole series? Yes, yes. But whenever I was in trouble, because I had a nasty habit of sneaking out, uh, and so whenever I did that, my daddy, he would grab particularly that book. It was his favorite, and because it was larger in size, it was like it had good heaviness, and so he would take that and give me just a little pop with that one. It beat India in a good way, in a good way. I'm responsible. I got a savings account and everything. What do you say little pop? What do you, what do you, how would you define that? Like you have the book in your hand and you just like, your hand doesn't go back any further than just the regular posture in front of your body. And then you just go pop. Oh, so more like a, so a love tap. Oh yeah. Okay. Because Lance, I think Lance, your point was that your father actually beat you with money. Yes, he would oh he would beat me with any mathematical or uh, financial instruments. He would hurl calculators at me. We actually had an abacus in the house and he literally hit me in the face with an abacus because uh, you know I at very early on he was teaching me financial theory and teaching me the equity markets and I failed 
to predict, you know, a market swing on a particular equity. And he hit me in the face with an abacus. Did you get it right the next time? Oh, yes. I never got it wrong. Ever, okay. Never again. So it's interesting that his he had a sort of a symbolic way of punishing you. Like it was always with with money or math related instruments. He always had some reason for using whatever tool he was about to hit you with hindsight being 2020 as you know as an adult monday morning quarterback in my entire life i look back and see that he had to plan these things he had to be prepared uh so he had to have calculators and abakai and uh, he had to have all sorts of rulers and anything mathematical or financial related coins denominations from from various countries and nations he was always ready to I think the term we would use now is abuse me with some sort of financial tool. Times were different back then. And I tell you, you know, now that I'm a parent of three, you never know what it's like to be a parent until you are one. So I guess that's the only thing I will say for your daddy, but. Amen. Amen. So Lance, as you grew up and became interested in finance yourself, was there any particular sector that you leaned toward? Was there any area of finance or any particular business that you decided to specialize in as an analyst? Well, I have studied all sorts of uh, items in the financial markets, uh, real estate, options trading, ETF, portfolio management. And I think I have solidified my interest in equities. It's a huge area of growth opportunity. You never want to time the market. Dale, Lydia, you never want to time the market. Do not time the market. Listen to what I'm telling you. I got to go change my calendar. Don't ever try to time the market. Okay. But there are really, really great opportunities for growth. You can always be the one to catch the next Alphabet, which is Google's parent company. Uh, you could be the one to catch the next Apple or Tesla, and it could literally change your life, you know, just by investing in the markets. As you, I don't know, as you moved toward finance uh, as a young man, were there other professions that tugged at your emotions? Did you lean maybe a little bit toward other things while you eventually made your way toward financial analysis? Or were you pretty self-directed and you and targeted at finance? Well, there was for a long time, Dale, I could not see anything except finance, uh, mostly because of the treatment of my father. But then at some point, we don't have to get into the details, but my father, who is deceased now because he was attacked by a pack of uh, rabid guinea pigs, when, when he died, it freed me to consider other things. I did regret that my father was deceased and I did not have the opportunity to decease him myself. So I did consider going into a life of serial killing that that actually was a plan of mine at some point oh my god yes lance i don't want to bring up too many horrible i'm sure horrible horrific images and memories but maybe we should get together and connect offline because i would love to know a little bit more about these rabid guinea pigs just for my own personal safety Oh, yes, absolutely. Anything I can do to help you, Lydia. Let's take a quick break, and we will be right back with Lance Bloomberg. Hey, optophobes. What's the thing you miss the most about being nine years old? Is it skateboarding around the neighborhood with your friends? Is it your grandma's hugs? Or staying up later than your bedtime to watch a football game with your dad? Nope. It's none of those things. The thing you miss the most about being nine is baloney. That's right, those slippery, floppy disks of emulsified meat scraps. Fatty, pressed organ meats that you pulled out of a brown paper sack at school and wolfed down like the short carnivore you were. Now you can wolf it down in a can, because Blend Venom Solutions has created a soda called Baloney Mist. We're all familiar with that yellow and red Oscar Mayer packaging. When you were nine, you never looked on the back of that package, but if you did, you'd see that Oscar Mayer's bologna is made with mechanically separated pork and chicken. There's no way, when you were nine, that you knew what the U.S. Department of Agriculture, Food Safety, and Inspection Service was. 
But that group of government people defines mechanically separated as, quote, a paste-like and batter-like meat product produced by forcing bones with attached edible meat under high pressure through a sieve or similar device to separate the bone from the edible meat tissue, end quote. We've flavored bologna mist with the venom of the coastal taipan, which causes headaches, vomiting, convulsions, paralysis, internal bleeding, the destruction of muscle tissue, and kidney damage. All of which we balance out by mixing it with a dollop of Miracle Whip and a refreshing splash of grapefruit tang. Blend Venom Solutions. We take away your thirst using snakes. Okay, we are back with our guest this week, Lance Bloomberg. Lance, at the end of the segment, the last segment, you were talking a little bit about how you had been tempted to become a serial killer. Uh, I wonder if that is connected to Relentless, and maybe you can set the scene a little bit. Well, in 1989, I had spent a significant amount of my life focusing on finances. It's all I could see. I didn't know anything else because it was literally beaten into me. And when my father passed, well, or should I say was was murdered by a pack of rabid guinea pigs, I decided that I was going to pursue some of the murderous thoughts that I had been experiencing. Because you felt as if the guinea pigs had stolen this opportunity from you? Exactly. Exactly. That's exactly what occurred, uh, Lydia. You, you are so observant, you and Dale both. So I saw in 1989 the movie Relentless, and I was extremely moved by the treatment that this young man had received since being a child from his father and how he chose to deal with that by going on a murderous, a very calculated murderous rampage. And as you know, I would not be able to do anything without calculating it first because my life has been spent in finance. Uh, so I just felt a lot of parallels between him and myself. And that's really what inspired me to start going down that path. Yeah. I mean, now that you mention it, the parallels are amazing. In the, in the movie, the character played by Judd Nelson was driven to, in some way, become a serial killer because of his treatment by his father, who had been a policeman, a legendary policeman. And he was beaten by his father and eventually became a serial killer because of it. So Lance, that's amazing that you connected in that way when you saw the movie. Yeah, I really did identify with him uh, and it really was inspirational. Uh, but Dale, I have to be honest with you, what started to happen was as I started to pay more attention to uh, my impulses towards rage, I started to spend less attention on my portfolio. Uh, and uh, my portfolio's performance started to decline. I was not selling at appropriate times during the cycle. I even tried to day trade for a little bit, which I, you know, I don't think is, is a good idea because that's trying to time the market. And as I told you both, don't do it. Don't time the market. Don't time the market. So yeah, my portfolio's performance really started to slip. And then I just started to ask myself a lot of questions like, yes, I could go on a murderous rampage, but what would that do to my finances? You know, I, I don't think it would have a positive impact on my portfolio. So I really had to start questioning whether or not murdering people would be the right thing for me to do. So Lance, the more and more that you talk about this, the more and more familiar it's starting to sound. At that time, just after your father's passing, and just when you were starting to have this prioritization of possibly murder over your personal and, you know, future in finances, you watched the movie and you connected to it and you said it impacted you. Did you happen to send a fan letter to Judd Nelson or to William Lustig? I did send many letters out. As you know, uh, some of the best serial killers, they like to uh, leave signatures. They like to collect trophies. And I did send a letter. The It was simply signed LB. Oh, my God. I used cutout letters from magazines, so no one would be able to tell that it was my handwriting. Of course, I could have just uh, typed it on a word processor or something like that back then, but I was 
I was trying to be creative, you know, trying to step outside of the financial box that my father had beat me into. So, yeah, I, I did send that letter. Yeah. So actually, as you can see right here, I have all the fan letters that were written, nobody wanted to keep those. And they were just going to throw them all out. All the letters that were written too relentless to either to Judd or Lustig or any of the producers, I was the one who maintained those. And they were just going to burn them after the movie was over. And I was like, no, like these are history. Like people really did connect to these. And there was one in particular that is signed LB and is exactly as you described. And I swear to God, everything you were saying, this one stuck with me the most. Wow. Lance, do you remember what you wrote in that letter? I do believe I started the letter by thanking them for composing such a theatrical masterpiece. I thank them for not only the directing and production quality of what they produced, but the acting by the actors was it was just superb. And I I thank them for all of that. And then I also thank them for inspiring me toward potentially achieving my dream, you know, which I was still considering at the time, but possibly to go on a, a murderous rampage. That's how the letter ends. Thank you so much. I am considering my own journey similar to the plot of Relentless. What a historical document. It's amazing you kept those, Lydia. I had to dig them out of my basement, but I never got rid of them. I, I want to go back a second, Lance, to exactly what it was from you in your memory of watching the movie that gave you that kind of inspiration that you felt like that you wanted to take pen to paper or magazine cut out letters to paper and send them to William Lustig. When you walked out of that movie theater, do you remember what you felt? I think the first verbatim sentence that came to mind after I saw that movie was I could be the calculator killer. <gasps> Verbatim. That was the first thing that came to mind. You had already named your serial killer self. Uh, yes. Yes. That's technically even a later step. Typically when people are thinking about becoming serial killers, they think about obviously the reasons why. Maybe they'll think about the props they use, but the name comes later. And that was the first thing that came to your mind. Whew. Well, you know, I have a deeply analytical mind and a part of even though even though you should never time the markets i can't stress this enough never time the markets i think it's very important to still look forward you have to forecast you have to try to anticipate what will happen based some on past performance you can you guys can ask me as much in-depth knowledge you want to receive about finance i'm totally game for that but basically it's just being analytical i felt like if you're going to brand yourself you should lead name first. And then every action you take, i.e. every murder you commit, should be on brand after you do that. I mean, one of the things that stood out about Relentless was the subliminal messaging in images and dialogue and music. Do you remember any of that happening? Or is it, do, you, do you feel that it was truly subliminal in that you didn't notice any of it happening, but that message still got through to your psyche? Dale, I had no idea that I was being influenced in the way that I was. The messages were completely subliminal. And I think the reason why they were so completely subliminal is because this was truly a theatrical masterpiece. The subtlety that was used, they were not heavy handed at all. And, and I think that's what served, you know, for, for me being a person of my background to be so susceptible to a film of this kind. Yeah. Was there one particular uh, murder in Relentless that you remember captivating you the most and inspiring you the most? There is a, a scene where one of the two members of law enforcement who are attempting to identify and, and bring this uh, misunderstood gentleman to, to justice, there is something leaked in the paper uh, and he is called sick in the paper. He did not have a positive reaction to that. And as a result, he quite adeptly murdered one of the two law enforcement officers. And I think the sense of vengeance really spoke to me. Vengeance of an authority figure. That really resonated with me. Played beautifully by legendary actor Robert Loggia. The other question I had 
uh, about the, the period immediately after you watching this movie was if you could maybe describe the tension between these new thoughts uh, that came to you subliminally of, of becoming the calculator killer and the tension of not doing that because of your worry about your portfolio. Initially, the idea of going on a rampage was so overwhelming that I really didn't, I didn't give any consideration to what the adverse effects on my portfolio would be. But as I started to research victims and plan how I would methodically execute these, these murders and my portfolio started to slip, that's when I really started to consider. There was one day where I bought two equities in the same day and neither of them paid a dividend. (gasps) And and I I just, I just had to sit back and and say, wow, like only the value of this stock will determine, you know, whether or not I experience uh, any revenue growth from it. And that really put me at a crossroads. So everything I'm hearing from you, Lance, is that what you observed in the movie you looked at that and kind of emulated that, but actually thought about it in a murder sense and then thought it wouldn't be because it's not your area of expertise. Your area of expertise is finance. And so what you've done, you have put your motivation and all of your drive into murdering the market. Exactly. Exactly. You realized your tools are different. Your tools are a calculator and a protractor and an abacus. But if you bring those and focus in on the equities and the markets, and those are the things you will be successful because that's your area of expertise. Are you feeling that at all? Indeed. And I will say that I was considering going to therapy, but you have done such a quality job of therapizing me just now that I think you've actually resolved all of my issues just within the last few minutes of this conversation. I mean, obviously, I'm no certified psychotherapist, but I swear, if there is anything I could do about your aversion to guinea pigs, please let me know. I will not hesitate. I will not hesitate. Unfortunately, we're going to have to leave it there for today. I want to thank our guest this week, Lance Bloomberg. Thanks for telling your story, Lance. It was powerful. Thank you, Dale, for having me. Thank you, Lydia. And thank you to all the people who lived because I decided to stick to financial management. Here, here. And thank you for the free advice to not time the market. Do not time the markets. Never time the market. I will never do that again. Again. And thank you to my co-host, as always, Lydia Coffee mate Please join us next week when our guest will be Bobby Ann Marsh from Tolstoy, South Dakota. Bobby Ann is a tour guide in the nearby ghost town of Whitlock's Crossing and is the president of a group of female relentless fans and failed serial killers called the Bordering on Cannibal Gals. Thank you for listening to Optophobia. I'm Dale Gribble, and I will leave you with this. Judge your friends cautiously and only if they are horrible people. If you've got a connection to Relentless, We'd like to hear it. You can find us on our website, optophobia.org, or on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at, at optophobes. And please subscribe and rate the show if you like it. Thank you to Slim Williams, who played Lance Bloomberg. Slim hosts the Enigma Variety Show for the Cookout Collective. He performs with Washington Improv Theater Ensemble's Madeline and Poetic Resistance, along with indie teams Revelry, and Earth, Wind, and Tired. Follow him on Instagram at at Big Slim. Thank you to Aaron Murray, who played Lydia Coffee Mate. Aaron performs with Madeline, a Washington Improv Theater house ensemble, and The Lodge. Follow her on Instagram at at Yearny B. Murray. Optophobia was produced by Tim Townsend. Music was composed by Bart Warshaw. Cover art by Claire Smalley. Additional website art by Nicole Bennett. Website by Chance Griffin. Thanks for listening. Until next week, keep them open.